Okay, so the last couple of class periods, we're talking about how to classify volcanic eruptions so that we have a working vocabulary when a new volcano pops up, you know, what kind of activity is it showing or what is it doing? How does it compare to other eruptions that we've known? So, you know, we looked at a couple different classification schemes, but we spent most of our time looking at the type locality scheme where we had Hawaiian eruptions, Strombolian eruptions, Surtsean eruptions, Vulcanian, Plinian, Ultraplinian. Those are the major types. Um, you can find some people that add in a few other ones like St. Helian for St. Helens. Um, but the ones we covered in class already are the major ones that if you read papers, you know, they'll talk about this eruption is showing Surtsean activity, blah, blah, blah. So you guys have at least this point an idea of what those terms mean. Now, like with any classification scheme, there's pros and cons, and it's probably worth talking about them just so that you know the application and limitation to this type of scheme. So obviously this is good for active eruptions because it's based on observation. You know, we looked at these things, how high are the columns, what type of eruption, uh, what type of products come out, um, how extensive is the area covered, things like that. So it's really good for active eruptions and it makes it pretty easy to compare eruption types, especially in this day and age because there's so much video out there. So even if you've never seen an active volca volcano in person, Hop on YouTube and you can find 40 examples of volcanian eruptions, lots of examples of Plinian and so on. The cons, and there's really one major one, what if you don't observe your eruption? How does this work for old eruptions? You know, where you have a volcano that hasn't erupted in, in modern time, but the, all these deposits are lying around. Can, is there any way to go back and say, oh, Mount Rainier, experienced a bunch of ultra Plinian events or a bunch of Plinian events. So it falls short for eruptions that don't provide you with observations. The other thing too is that sometimes it gets confusing because a single eruption might be able to depict several different types of type eruptions. You can have an eruption start out as a Surtsean erupting through water and culminate with a series of volcanic explosions and maybe even a caldera forming ultraplinian event. So one eruption sequence might have several type eruptions occurring during it. And that can add to some confusion about exactly what's going on. And again, what about these older eruptions or those that you can't observe either because it's short-lived and happens at night or volcanoes are t notorious for erupting during bad weather or creating its own bad weather? Or maybe it's a polar eruption where you just have a lack of light because of the seasons. So this eruption is based on being able to observe it. So it works good for active volcanoes, but not elsewhere. Well, there's a rather famous volcanologist, George Walker. He was a professor at the University of Hawaii forever, and he was a field geologist. He loved getting out in the field and looking at volcanic deposits. And that was his biggest beef with the type locality is how do we use it on older, older volcanoes? Is there some way to look at a deposit and back out what kind of eruption observations may have been taking place at that time. And what he noticed was with explosive eruptions, they left deposits behind. And the deposits vary according to what type of eruption produced it. A Plinian eruption deposit is really different than a Hawaiian eruption deposit. Remember Hawaiian is really low columns with lots of spatter, starts out as a curtain of fire, localizes down to a vent, doesn't produce much ash, basically throws around ooey gooey basalt, lands on the ground, congeals together, forms spatter cones, big globs of this stuff. That's really different than an ultraplinian where the stuff is 
pulverized to super fine amount, spreads out over a huge area. So he came up with a classification system for older eruptions that's based on how fragmented the material is by the eruption and the pattern of how the material is spread over the landscape. So it's based on fragmentation and dispersion. And like with all science projects, you want something to be repeatable. You want others to be able to follow it. So he came up with a method that he thought others could follow and would re yield results that would be comparable and accurate. So what he does first is he looks at the total area of ash cover. And, you know, when you get to the farthest reaches of an ash deposit, sometimes ash falls in one place and then it doesn't fall in another place and sometimes the wind blows it away. So to get away from those sort of fringe outer deposits, what he said is we're going to measure an area that includes all of the ash that's within 1% of the maximum thickness. So if you had a maximum thickness of ash that was 100 meters thick, and for a Plinian event, that's not unusual. You can get 100 meters of ash falling. Basically said, we're going to look at the area where the ash is one meter thick and more, 1% of that. Now, if that's a Hawaiian eruption, remember Hawaiian eruptions, the you know ash goes up a few hundred feet, comes splattering back down. It can be pretty thick. You can get spatter cones that are 100 meters tall, but you don't find a meter thick deposit very far away. It's really localized. So the area would be pretty small, but an ultra Plinian event can leave a meter of ash a thousand miles away. So the area is going to be much different. So these isopac maps, an isopac is a line of equal thickness. So this is here, you look for the vent, if the deepest layer of ash you see is, let's say in this case, one meter, then you look at what's the area enclosed by one one hundredth of that. In this case, it'd be a centimeter. And you measure it and note that area. So that's your dispersion. And then, remember, fragmentation is a measure of the explosivity of an eruption. And he decided to make it easiest way to measure is that he is going to measure the percent of material that's really fine at a certain distance away. And that distance away is going to be a percentage of the actual thickness. So he's going to measure it where the deposit is one tenth of the total thickness. In this case, if the maximum thickness is about a meter, he's going to look where this axis of dispersion crosses the 0.1 meter isopack. And then he takes a sample of ash and he sees what percentage of it is really fine, less than a millimeter. Now, if that's spatter, you're not going to get any. And if it's a Sertzian eruption, that might be all you get. So it's going to depend on how pulverized the ash is. And this measurement spot at point A is just a way to keep it consistent from eruption to eruption. So he wanted a method that was repeatable that would measure both dispersion and fragmentation. And then you plot it on here. So the area enclosed by 1% of the maximum thickness is plotted on the bottom. And it can be very small, going down to zero on the left, or as big as... 50,000 or more square kilometers for the ultra Plinian type. And then fragmentation goes from zero where you'd have no fine material at that one site or 100%. And he compared this to modern eruptions and kind of came up with these fields where, you know, these last two that cover huge areas and are super pulverized would be the Plinian and ultra Plinian. Going all the way down to Hawaii, remember Hawaii just tends to throw spatter, so you basically don't get any real fine material, and it doesn't spread out very big. 
So Hawaii has the most limited reach or dispersion and the least fragmentation. Ultrapollinian has the most dispersion and the most fragmentation. And there's kind of a couple oddballs that don't fit on here real nice. One, Sertzian. Remember, Sertzian is the one that goes through water columns. So the stuff doesn't go very far, but it's real energetic, and the ash just gets pulverized into sand. So it's almost all a millimeter or less, but it just doesn't cover a really wide area. It forms these little cones and things. So basically, you can go to an old deposit, pick up some ash, do some measurements, and you can have a pretty good idea of how that old deposit erupted in the past. And you go to a place like the Cascades with the big Cascade volcanoes and look at all the ash layers that came out of Mount Rainier and you can say, oh, you know, in the last 20,000 years, this had three Ultraplinian events and a few Volcanian events. Um, that's really different than maybe Mount Adams that had more or less of a certain type. And you can start to compare volcanic activity by backing out the eruption type from the ash deposits. So it's kind of a neat field-based way of tying the observations to the deposit. And this is used pretty standard in volcanology today. So now we have a way of using that type locality on eruptions that are happening today that we can observe and on older ones as well. So it's a, it's a pretty nice eruption classification scheme. Any questions on this? Okay, pros and cons of this classification. Obviously, it's good for envisioning what the eruption looked like that produced the deposit where you actually didn't see the eruption. It's an easy, repeatable, consistent, straightforward way to measure. There'd be other ways you could do this, but this is the way that he thought was the most reliable. He tried several different variations of this, and this is the one he felt gave the most repeatable results. And the big thing, as we talked about earlier, it can be used for eruptions where we don't observe it either active ones that are too remote, at night, wrong season, whatever, bad weather, or older ones where there were no observations at all. But like all other classification schemes, it's not perfect. It's highly both, so both the dispersion measurements and the fragmentation measurements were dependent on measuring the maximum thickness. Because for dispersion, you look at the area enclosed by 1% of the maximum thickness. And for fragmentation, you take a sample at 10%. Of the maximum thickness. So that means you have to measure the maximum thickness. And you can't measure the thickness everywhere. I mean, you go out and you measure, you dig down a trench here, and you have a road cut here, and you have something there, and you just hope you get the thickest amount. And if you're off by a little, then this could be off as well. So that's probably the biggest weakness to this classification is No, it doesn't. If you, it, well, I think the um, d-axis was a little, yeah. The d-axis, the dispersion, the area, I think that was log. I'd have to look back. But so you know things can get extended at the higher order. You could be off by a lot. But at the end there, if you look at the dispersion for like the ultra plinian, it's a wide range. Yeah. And yeah, the, the boundaries can start to vary and you could end up measuring a plinian when it was actually ultra plinian. So definitely some 
potential to be off, especially close to the boundaries. The other thing too is that you have to measure T max, right? And then you have to you have to put together these isopack maps, maps of equal thickness of the units. Well, what if they erode? What if it lands on a steep slope and slumps down and gets artificially thick in one area? So there's some potential pitfalls based on how the deposits will disperse and deposit over local topography. And then you hope it doesn't, a lot of it doesn't blow away which is possible, or turn into soil. If it just sits there for several hundred years, a lot of the upper surface might turn to soil. So again, not a perfect way to do this, but you do the best you can. You know, that's the thing with geology is, we have a lot of slop in our numbers and a lot of uh, error in our measurements. You just sort of get used to dealing with that. And this classification scheme is no different. And obviously, you can't do this during eruption, but hopefully you have the observations. You, know, you have to wait for the eruption to finish before you can start measuring all this stuff. But like I said, hopefully you have observations that will tell you whether it's Pliny and Ultra Pliny and Surtsey, Volcanian, et cetera. And then finally, you got to remember 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. So if you have a submarine eruption with ocean currents, it's not going to work as well or work at all. And if you have a terrestrial eruption that blows ash over water, that can really complicate things as well. So for a a big ash producing eruption in Iceland. This might not work at all because a bunch of your ash may be dispersed over the ocean itself. Finally, sometimes it's not always possible to, you know, looking at ash in the field can be difficult. It's sometimes difficult to look and say, is this one ash layer or two ash layers? or six ash layers. Sometimes it's not always clear where one layer ends and another begins, and that can really mess up measuring your isopacks. You might get an artificially thick one if you include more than one eruption. Okay, I'm gonna spend just a minute or two talking about this. It's another way at looking at eruptions and classifying. In this case, it's based on something we call the volcanic explosivity index. I think of it kind of as a Richter scale for volcanic eruptions. Starts at zero, goes up to about eight, It's based mostly on the volume of material that's erupted. Just how much stuff comes out during the eruption. And it's log scale, like the Richter scale. Every jump on the VEI is an order of magnitude bigger in volume. So St. Helens, for me, it's kind of the easiest eruption to think about because for me, I've seen more eruption video and photos of that eruption than probably anything else. And that was a five. That was a, that was a good eruption, you know, but compared to a Mount Pinatubo or a Tambora or even a Yellowstone, it's not even in the ballpark. So Mount St. Helens erupted a cubic kilometer of material. So roughly a rock cube a half mile by half mile by half mile, all ground up and just tossed over the landscape, fragmented. Pinatubo in 1991, uh, the video that I assigned last week, that was about 10 times bigger than St. Helens. That was a really good Pliny to Ultra Pliny eruption. 
biggest of the decade, but that was only a tenth the size of Mount Tambora, which altered weather for several years back in the 1800s, eruption in, New, in uh, Indonesia. And then finally, the Yellowstone eruptions were 10 to 25 times bigger than that. So, an eight, you know, we don't get a lot of uh, earthquakes greater than a magnitude eight. That's, I mean, we've actually had some up near nine, but eight is just a big, huge, terrible earthquake. That's really the same with volcanic eruptions. These don't happen as frequently as magnitude eight earthquakes. A seven is big and scary. Even a five is gonna leave a real mess. So when you see this VEI volcano explosivity index, you can think of St. Helens as being a five, Yellowstone as being an eight. Just to give yourself sort of a frame of reference for how big things are. You've seen, I think in here, I think last week I had a couple of maps kind of of the uh, extent of the ash layer. And there was very measurable ash. Today it would be feet to meters over a good part of the Western US. Now would that wipe out life here in the United States? No, but it, and it would mess up weather patterns. It would mess up growing seasons. It would depend on when it happened. If it happens, say, early summer, you probably lose every crop in the U.S. And we grow a lot of food for the world here. So the world would feel it. If it happened in the winter, northern winter, maybe not so much. So a lot of things would go into it. But would it wipe out humans? Probably not. I mean, there was an VEI-8 eruption 70 some thousand years ago that almost wiped out humanity, but it didn't. And that was, you know, 70,000 years ago. Pre-science, people living outside, not a lot of humans on the planet. We survived that one. The world, I think, would survive a Yellowstone. People like to make such a big deal about it. It would make a hell of a mess and it would certainly disrupt things. And I wouldn't want to experience it, but. I don't worry about it because Yellowstone, all of its past eruptions have had 10 to 70,000 years of lead up activity. So you get smaller eruptions well before the big one and we haven't even started those yet. When they do start, people are gonna go crazy. But like you said, there's not, this big one is not likely to happen for some time after that precursory activity starts. All right, any other questions on this? All right, I've got a couple other um, types of eruptions. I'm gonna save this and put it online so we can move ahead. Flood basalts are awesome. You'll wanna watch this. I'll put up a video and there's, I have a video within the video that's really good. It talks about how flood basalts affect everything and how it probably led to extinctions in the past. In fact, maybe the biggest extinction in the history of Earth was caused by flood basalts. And it goes into sort of the chain reaction that it would set off. It's really well done. It's done by this German guy. So you have to put up with a heavy German accent, but um, it's really a wonderful video to watch. And I'll try to get that up over the weekend. 